The Fundamentals of Defectology, Abnormal Psychology and Learning Disabilities by Lev Vygotsky. Chapter 1, Defect and Compensation. In those systems of psychology which place at their center an integral approach to personality, the idea of overcompensation plays a dominant role. What does not destroy me makes me stronger is the idea formulated by W. Stern when he pointed out that strength arises from weakness and ability from deficiencies. The psychological trend created by the school of Adler, the Austrian psychiatrist, is very widespread and influential in Europe and America. This so-called individual psychology, i.e. the psychology of personality, has developed the idea of overcompensation into a whole system, into a complete doctrine about the mind. Overcompensation is not some rare or exceptional phenomenon in the life of an organism. An endless number of examples can be given demonstrating this concept. Rather, it is to the highest degree a common and extremely widespread feature of living matter. True, until now, no one has worked out an inexhaustible and comprehensive biological theory of overcompensation. In a series of separate ideas of organic life, these phenomena have been studied so thoroughly and their practical application is so extensive that we have substantial grounds for talking about overcompensation as a scientifically established fundamental fact in the life of an organism. We inoculate a healthy child with a vaccine. The child endures a mild case of the disease and upon recovering becomes immune to smallpox for many years. This organism acquires an immunity i.e. it not only has recovered from a mild illness, which was brought on by inoculation, but comes out of the disease healthier than before. This organism succeeded in producing an antidote, which was considerably stronger than the vaccine it administered. If we now compare our child with others who have not been vaccinated, then we shall see that with respect to this terrible illness, he is overly healthy. He will not only not become ill now, like other healthy children will, but he will not even be able to become sick. He will remain healthy even when his poison again infiltrates the bloodstream. While at first glance paradoxical, this organic process which transforms sickness into superior health, weakness into strength, and infection into immunity bears the label of superior overdevelopment or overcompensation, as some authors say. This means, essentially, that any injury to or negative influence on an organism evokes from it defensive reactions which are considerably more energetic and stronger than is necessary to render the immediate danger harmless. An organism represents a relatively close or closed internally connected system of organs which possesses a large reserve of potential energy and concealed strengths. In a moment of danger, it acts as a unified integral whole, which mobilizes its latent reserves of accumulated strengths and bombards the endangered location with much larger doses of the antidotes than the dose of bacteria threatening it. In this way, the organism not only compensates for the harm inflicted on it, but always generates a surplus of the antidote gaining superiority over the danger and rendering the organism considerably more able to defend itself than before the onset of danger. White blood cells rush to the infected area in greater quantity than is needed to combat the infection. This too is an example of overcompensation. If a tuberculosis patient is treated with an injection of tuber tuberculin, i.e tubercle baculus, then the organism is being counted on with an injection or fuck, then the organism is being counted on to overcome it. The, discre the discrepancy between irritation and reaction, the inequality between the action and the counter reaction within the organism, the surplus of the antidote, the cultivation of superior health through disease, and the ascendancy to a higher stage by overcoming danger are all important factors for medicine and pedagogy, treatment and education. 
Even in psychology, this phenomenon was widely adopted when the mind began to be studied not in, not in isolation from the organism, a soul dissected from the body, but within the organism's system as its distinct, unique, and higher function. Overcompensation was found to play no lesser role in the system of personality. It will suffice to look at modern psychotechnics where such an important personality forming function as physical exercise essentially amounts to the phenomenon of overcompensation. Adler turned his attention to defectively functioning organs which had been impeded or destroyed as a result of a handicap. Such organs out of necessity enter into combat and struggle with the external world to which they must adjust. This struggle is accompanied at times by increased illness and fatality, but it also bears the seeds of increased possibilities for over overcompensation. In the case of illness or removal of one of two organs, a kidney, a lung, the other organ takes over the full function of both and develops in a compensatory manner. Similarly, the central nervous system takes over the compensation of a single impaired organ, determining more precisely and perfecting the work of that organ. The psychological system superimposes on that organ a psychological superstructure which elevates and increases the efficiency of the remaining organ's operation. The sensation of having a defective organ constantly stimulates the individual's psychological development. Adler quotes O Rule. The feeling or consciousness of one's inferiority caused by an individual's defect reflects an evaluation of one's social position. This feeling becomes the primary driving force behind psychological development, significantly intensifying the phenomena of presentiment and foresight, along with their operating factors such as memory, intuition, attention, sensitivity, interest in a word, all the psychological features. Over, oops, over compensation. Mm -hmm. Overcompensation leads to the consciousness of superior health in a diseased organism, to the transformation of an inferiority complex into a, into a superiority complex, a defect into giftedness and ability. Having struggled with a speech defect, Demosthenes went on to become one of Greece's greatest orators. It was said of him that he acquired his great art being, by increasing his natural handicap by magnifying and multiplying the obstacles. He practiced his speech pronunciation, filling his mouth with stones and trying to overcome the roar of the ocean waves, which muffled his voice. Sunan vero ben travato. Even if it is not true, it is well thought up, goes the Italian proverb. The way to perfection is through the conquest of obstacles. The obstruction of a function stimulates a higher level of its operation. In smaller ways, L. von Beethoven and A. S. Suvorov serve as examples of this. The stuttering K. Demelin, who was an outstanding or orator, the blind deaf mute Helen Keller, a famous writer and prophet of optimism. Two circumstances force us to take a special look at this doctrine. First of all, particularly in the circles of German social democracy, it is often linked with the teaching of, of Karl Marx. Second, this doctrine is intrinsically tied to pedagogy in theory and in practice. We will put this question aside in as much as the doctrine of individual psychology is connected with Marxism. The solution of this question would demand a special investigation. We note only that there have already been attempts made to synthesize Marx and Adler and to study personality within the context of the philosophical and social system of dialectical materialism. We are attempting to understand the reasoning behind the reproachment of these two lines of thought. A new direction has already emerged, separating itself from the school of, of Sigmund Freud as a result of the differences in political and social views of the advocates of psychoanalysis. Apparently, the political side played a significant role here and as much as F. Whittle tells how Adler and some of his supporters withdrew from the psychoanalytical circle. Adler and his nine friends were social democrats. Many of his followers like to stress this point. Rule, who attempted to synthesize Marx and Adler in his work on the psychology of the proletarian child, 
states that Sigmund Freud up until now has done everything to make um, his, everything to make his teachings available and useful only to the reigning social strata. As a counterbalance, A. Adler's individual psychology bears a revolutionary character and its conclusions fully coincide with the principles of Marxist revolutionary socialism. As has already been mentioned, all this is debatable, but there are two aspects which make such a reproach, reproachment psychologically possible and warrant attention. The first is the dialectical character of the new doctrine. The second is the social basis of opposition. A defect, ineptitude, or inferiority is not simply a minus, a shortcoming, a negative attribute, but also a stimulus for overcompensation. Adler introduces the basic psychological law of dialectical transformation. As a result of a subjective feeling of inferiority, an organic defect will be transformed into a psychological drive to compensate and overcompensate. From this position, Adler allows us to include psychology in the context of a broad biological and social doctrine. Indeed, all true scientific psychology Sorry, indeed, all true scientific thought is advanced by means of dialectics. Even Charles Darwin taught that adaptation results from unfitness, from struggle, destruction, selection. Marx too taught that in contrast to utopian socialism, the development of capitalism will inevitably lead to communism through the demise of the capitalistic dictatorship of the proletariat and will not retreat to the sidelines somewhere as might seem possible from a superficial glance. Adler's teachings also attempt to illustrate how an expedient and higher level arises from an inex inexpedient lower level. As A.B. Zalkind correctly noted, the psychology of personality breaks away from the biological stimulus approach to personality and manifests itself as a really revolutionary char character characterological movement. Because in contrast to the teachings of Freud, it puts the dynamic formulating forces of history and social life in the place of biological fate. Adler's teachings stand in opposition not only to the reactionary biological schemes of E. Kretschmer, for whom an innate cons constitution defines body structure, while character and the entire subsequent development of human character is equated with a passive unfolding of that basic biological type inherent in man. Adler's teachings, however, are also in opposition to Freud's characterological system. Two ideas set Adler apart from Freud. The idea of the social basis for the development of personality and the idea of the ultimate direction of this process. Individual psychology negates the essential connection between the organic substrata and the overall psychological development of personality and character. The entire psychological life of an individual consists of a succession of combative objectives directed at the resolution of a single task to secure a definite position with respect to the imminent logic of human society or to the demands of the social environment. In the last analysis, the fate of personality is decided not by the existence of a defect in itself, but by its social consequences, by its socio-psychological realization. In connection with this, it becomes necessary for the psychologist to understand each psychological act, not only with respect to the past, but also in conjunction with the future direction of personality. We may call that we may call that we may call this the ultimate direction of our behavior. Simply put, understanding psychological phenomena from the perspective of both the future and the past essentially represents the dialectical need to perceive phenomena in eternal movement and to bring to light their future-oriented tendencies determined by the present. Adler's teachings on the structure of personality and character introduce a new and profound future-oriented perspective, which is valuable for psychology. It frees us from the conservative, backward-looking teachings of Freud and Kretschmer. Just as life of each, just as the life of each organism is directed by the biological need to adapt, so too the dynamics of personality are guided by the daily social demands. We are not in a position to think, feel, want, or act without some kind of goal before us, states Adler. 
Both a single act and the development of personality as a whole may be understood on the basis of their future-oriented tendencies. In other words, the psychological life of a man, like a dramatic character created by a good playwright, strives for its final denouement of the fifth act. The future-oriented perspective introduced by this interpretation of psychological processes brings us to one of the two aspects of Adler's method which compels our attention, individual psychological pedagogy. In Whittle's opinion, pedagogy is the main area of application of Adler's psychology. At the same time, with respect to the psychological trend we have just described, pedagogy occupies the same place that medicine does for the biological sciences, engineering for physics and chemistry and politics for the social sciences, namely the highest category of truth, since man proves the truth of his thoughts only by application. From the outset, it is clear why precisely this psychological movement helps us understand child development and child rearing. In the unsocialized and unadapted state of childhood lie the very seeds of overcompensation or the superior overdevelopment of functions. The more adapted some young animal species are, the smaller their potential for future development and rearing. A guarantee of superiority is given only in the presence of inferiority. Hence, ineptness and overcompensation represent the motive forces of childhood development. Such an understanding gives us the key to classical psychology and pedagogy, just as just as the flow of a current is defined by its shores and its riverbeds. Similarly, the main psychological line of a growing child's development is defined out of objective necessity by the social channel and social shorelines shaping personality. The doctrine of overcompensation has an important significance and serves as a psychological basis for the theory and practice of educating a child with a loss of hearing, sight, and so forth. What horizons will open up to the pedagogue when he recognizes that a defect is not only a minus, a deficit, or a weakness, but also a plus, a source of strength, and that it has some positive implications. In essence, psychologists learned this a long time ago. Pedagogues have also known this. Only now, however, has this most fundamental law been formulated with scientific accuracy. A child will want to see everything if he is nearsighted, hear everything if he has a hearing loss. He will want to speak if he has a speech problem or a stutter. The desire to fly will appear in children who experience great difficulty even in jumping. The dynamic forces of any educational system spring precisely from this opposition between a given organic defect and desires, fantasies, and dreams that is the psychological drive to compensate for the, for the defect or loss. In educational practice, this is confirmed at every step. If we hear that a boy limps and therefore runs better than anyone else, we understand that it is a question of this very law. If experimental research shows that in comparison with the maximum reactions occurring under normal conditions, greatly accelerated and intensified reactions will occur in the face of obstacles. Then again, then again, we have the same law. The concept of exemplary human personality, which includes an understanding of its organic unity, must serve as the basis for educating an abnormal child. In contrast with other psychologists, W. Stern examined the structure of personality in greater depth. He presumed the following. We have no right to conclude that a person with an established abnormality has a propensity for abnormality. In this same light, it is impossible to reduce a given abnormal personality to a specific isolated characteristic as the sole primary cause. We shall apply this law to somatics and psychology, to medicine and pedagogy. In medicine, there is a growing tendency to base the sole criterion for health or illness on the question of whether or not the entire organism functions expediently while individual abnormalities are taken into account only in as much as they are normally or insufficiently compensated for by other functions of the organism. Moreover, in psychology, 
Microscopic analysis of abnormalities has led to reevaluation and an examination of these functions as an expression of an overall abnormality in the personality. If we are to apply Stern's ideas to education, then it will be necessary to reject both the concept and the term defective, handicapped children. T. Lips examined this question in the light of a general law for all psychological activity, which he called the law of deemed up energy. If any psychological event is interrupted or impeded in its natural course, or if at some point an alien element intrudes, then there occurs a flood of energy at the point of interruption, delay, or agitation in the course of the psychological event. Energy is concentrated at the given point. It is increased and can overcome the delay. It may continue to flow, but in a roundabout way. Here, among other things, the high value placed on things lost or damaged is relevant. This constitutes the main idea of overcompensation. Lips gave this law universal significance. In general, he viewed any drive as a manifestation of this phenomenon of flooding. He examined not only comic and tragic experiences, but also cognitive profit processes by the operation of this law. When there appears some obstacle, any purposeful activity will necessarily be channeled through some previous aimless automatic event. Present in the damned up energy is the tendency to move to one side. The goal, which is impossible to reach by a direct path, is attained thanks to an overflow of force channeled by one such detour. The goal of any mental process can be attained only thanks to some difficulty, delay, or obstacle. The point of interruption of any automatic function becomes a goal for other functions. Now directed at this point, they are transformed into purposeful, goal-oriented activity. For this reason, a defect and the resultant dis disruption of the normal functioning of, of, of personality become the ultimate development or developmental goal for all individual mental powers. This is why Adler called a defect the basic motivating force in development and the final goal in life's plan. The formula defect overcompensation is the main line of development for a child with some functional or organic defect. Thus, the goal is defined beforehand, yet it only seems to be the goal when in fact it is the primary cause of development. The education and rearing of handicapped children should be based on the fact that along with a defect come combative psychological tendencies and the potential for overcoming the defect. Education of these children should take into account that precisely these tendencies emerge in the foreground of a child's development and must be included in the educational process as his motivating strength. Constructing the entire educational process on the basis of natural compensatory drives does not mean alleviating all difficulties that arise as a result of the defect. It means instead concentrating all strengths on the compensation of the defect selecting in the appropriate sequential order those, tax, those tasks which will bring about the gradual formation of the entire personality from a new standpoint. What a liberating truth for the pedagogue. A blind child develops a psychological superstructure circumventing his impaired vision with only one goal in mind, to replace sight. Using every possible means available to him, a deaf child works out ways to overcome the isolation and seclusion caused by his deafness. Up to now, we have neglected these psychological powers. We have not taken into account the desire with which such a child struggles to be healthy and fully accepted socially. A defect has been stat statically viewed as merely a defect, a minus. Education has neglected the positive forces created by a defect. Psychologists and pedagogues have not been acquainted with Adler's law of the, position, of the position between a physical handicap and the psychological drives to compensate. They have taken into account only the former, the defect. They didn't understand that a handicap is not just an impoverished psychological state, but also a source of wealth, not just a weakness, but a strength. They thought that the they thought that the development of a blind child centers on his blindness. As it turns out, his development strives to transcend blindness. 
The psychology of blindness is essentially the psychology of victory over blindness. An inaccurate understanding of the psychology of the handicapped has caused the failure of traditional education for blind and deaf children. The previous understanding of defect only as a defect is similar to the view that the vaccination of a healthy child merely cultivates disease in him. In fact, it produces superior health. It is most important that education depend not only on the development of natural strengths, but also on the ultimate goal toward which they must be oriented. Full social esteem is the ultimate aim of education in as much as all the processes of overcompensation are directed at achieving social status. Compensation strives not for further deviation from the norm, even in a positive sense, but for a superior, if somewhat one-sided, twisted, hypertrophied development of personality. It nevertheless strives in the direction of the norm and toward an approximation of a certain normal social type. A definite social type always serves as the norm for overcompensation. We will find in a deaf mute child cut off from the world and excluded from all social contact, not a decreased desire to communicate, but an intensified desire to be included in social life. Such a child's psychological capacity for speech is in reverse proportion to his physical ability to produce speech. Although it may seem paradoxical, a deaf child, even more than an a normal child wants to speak and vigorously, impetuously gravitates towards speech. Our educational system has sidestepped this issue, and the deaf, without any instruction and in spite of it, have created their own language, arising from this desire to communicate. This is something for the psychologist to examine. Herein lies the reason why the deaf mute have failed to develop oral speech. In exactly the same way, a blind child develops an increased ability to master space. In comparison with a seeing child, the blind child has a greater sensitivity toward that world which is accessible to us without the slightest difficulty, thanks to sight. A defect is not only a weakness, but also a strength. In this psychological truth lie the alpha and omega of social education for children. The ideas of T. Lips, W. Stern, and A. Adler contain a wholesome nucleus for the psychology of the education of handicapped children. These ideas, however, are obscured by their vagueness, and in order to completely grasp their significance, we must explain more precisely how they relate to other psychological theories and views, which are similar in form or spirit. First of all, the unscientific optimism which spawned these ideas easily, or easily arouses our suspicion. If every defect gives rein to some compensatory strength, then it can be seen as a blessing. Is this really true? Overcompensation, in fact, is only one extreme of two opposite outcomes, one of two possible poles of development affected by a defect. The other extreme is the total failure to compensate retreat into illness, neurosis, complete asociality from a psychological standpoint. Unsuccessful compensation transforms the child's energies into a defensive battle with illness, directed toward a false goal, heading life's entire course along a false path. Between these two extremes, we find every possible degree of compensation from minimal to maximal. Secondly, these ideas are easily confused with direct opposing views and can be mistaken for a return to the past, to a Christian mystical notion of weakness and suffering. Do we not find in the ideas indicated above a high value placed on the superiority of illness at the expense of health, on the recognition of the benefit of suffering, and in general on the cultivation of weak, wretched, and impotent forms of life to the detriment of the strong, the normal, and the powerful? No, the new doctrine places a high value not on suffering itself, but on overcoming it. Not on the humble acceptance of a defect, but on mutiny against it. Not on weakness alone, but on the impulses and sources of strength engendered, engendered in it. Thus, the new doctrine is diametrically opposed to the Christian understanding of the sick. At issue is not poverty, but potential wealth of spirit. Misery becomes the impulse for overcoming weakness and building up strength. 
There is a close affinity between Adler's ideal of strength or power and the philosophy of F. Nietzsche, for whom the will to power was the primary motivating drive in man's psychological makeup. However, Adler's view that social significance is the ultimate goal of compensation just as clearly divorces psychology both from the Christian ideal of weakness and from the Nietzschean cult of individual strength. Third, we must distinguish the doctrine of defect over compensation from the old, naive biological theory of organic compensation, or in any case, from the theory of the substitution of sensory organs. Doubtless, this view already contained the first presentiment of that truth which states that the failure of one function serves as the impetus for the development of other compensatory functions. But this presentiment is expressed naively and is distorted. The relationship between sensory organs may be compared to the relationship between paired organs. Touch and hearing directly compensate for the loss of sight in the same manner as one health ki healthy kidney will take over the function of the other diseased one. In this case, the impaired organ, the eye, automatically capitulates to the healthy organs and recedes into the background, while the ear and skin, leaping over all socio-psychological instances, are stimulated to compensate. After all, loss of sight does not affect the vital and, ne and necessary functions. Science and practice have long since exposed the, sh the shortcomings of this theory. Factual research has shown that intensification of hearing and touch does not occur automatic automatically as a result of impaired vision. On the contrary, in a blind, blind child, we are dealing not with the possibility of sight being automatically replaced, but with the difficulties arising from its absence. These, dif these difficulties are resolved by the development of a psychological superstructure. Thus, we encounter the view that the blind possess a heightened memory, intensified attention, and enhanced verbal skills. A. Petzold, who has written the best work on the psychology of the blind, saw precisely the basic characteristic of overcompensation in this phenomenon. He proposes that what is the most distinctive feature in the personality of the blind is the power to internalize by means of speech the social experience of the seeing. H. Grisbach has shown that the teachings on the transference of one sense organ have not withstood criticism. A blind person is brought just as near to the seeing world as he is removed from it by this theory of transference. There really is a kernel of truth in the theory that a defect is not limited to its isolated functional failure, but also involves a radical reconstruction of the entire personality. A defect brings to life new psychological powers and gives them new direction. Only a naive understanding of the purely organic nature of compensation, a disregard of the socio-psychological aspect of this process, and an ignorance of the ultimate direction and overall nature of overcompensation, distinguish the old doctrine from the new one. Fourth, we must finally ascertain the true implications of Adler's doctrine, judging by our recently formed therapeutic social pedagogy based on the data of reflex psychology. The distinction between these two circles of ideas can be summed up with the statement that our doctrine of conditional reflexes offers a new basis for constructing a mechanism for the educational process. The doctrine of overcompensation offers a new mechanism for understanding the very process of child development. Many authors, including this one, have analyzed the education of the blind and deaf from the point of view of conditional reflexes and have come to a more profound and important conclusion. There is no fundamental difference between the education of a seeing and a blind child. New conditional connections are formed identically from any input. The effect of organized external influences is a determining factor on education. The first school directed by I.A. Sokoliansky worked out a new method for teaching deafblind children speech on the basis of this doctrine, and with it achieved both amazing practical results and theoretical positions, which surpassed the most progressive systems of European special education for the hearing impaired. We must not, however, stop here. It is impossible to think that theoretically all differences between the education of the blind, deaf, and normal children 
can be limited. This is impossible because in fact, a difference exists and makes itself known. Historically, all past experiences with education for the deaf and the blind attest to this. It is still absolutely necessary to take into account the specific developmental characteristics of a child with a defect. The educator must become aware of those specific features and factors in children's development which respond to their uniqueness and which demand it. From a pedagogical, <laughs> from a pedagogical point of view, a blind or deaf child may, in principle, be equated with a normal child, but the deaf or blind child achieves the goals of a normal child by different means and by a different path. <clears throat> it is also particularly important for the educator to know precisely the uniqueness of the path on which he must lead the child, since it is impossible to state that blindness does not cause a profoundly unique main line of development. Essentially, the ultimate character of all psychological acts their future-oriented direct directedness becomes apparent in the most elementary forms of behavior. Goal-oriented behavior had already been observed in the simplest forms of behavior, which the Pavlovian school studied from the point of view of conditional reflex mechanisms. Among innate ref reflexes, Pavlov discovered a unique goal-oriented reflex. With this contradictory label, he probably intended to point out two factors. One, the fact that even here we are dealing with a reflex mechanism. And two, the fact that this mechanism takes on the appearance of purposeful activity. That is, becomes intelligible only in relation to the future. All life is the realization of one goal, says Pavlov. The preservation of life. Indeed, he called this reflex the reflex of life. All of life's advancements, all its culture are achieved by means of this goal-directed reflex and is achieved only by those people striving to attain a specific goal which they themselves have set. Pavlov straightforwardly formulated the significance of this reflex for education. His ideas coincide <clears throat> with the theory of compensation. For a complete, true and fruitful manifestation of the goal reflex, he says, it must be placed under a specific amount of stress. In Anglo-Saxon, the highest embod embodiment of this reflex knows this well, and therefore he will answer the question, what is the main condition for achieving a goal? In a manner most unexpected and incredible to a Russian's eye and ear with the answer, the existence of obstacles. It is as if he were saying, let my goal reflex exert itself in response to some obstacle, and precisely then I will attain my goal, no matter how difficult it may be. It is interesting that the possibility of failure is totally ignored with such an answer. Pavlov regretted that we do not have any practical knowledge about such an important factor in life as the goal reflex. This knowledge is so essential in all areas of life, beginning with the most fundamental education. C. Sherrington has said the same about this reflex. In his opinion, a reflex reaction cannot really be understood by a physiolog physiologist without knowledge of its goal, and he can learn about this goal only by examining reaction in light of the whole organic complex <clears throat> of normal functions. This position guarantees the right to sim synthesize both psychological theories. The strategic position of the Adlerites, A.B. Zalkine states, represents the very same dominant point, not only in general physiological terms, but also in clinical and psychotherapeutic formulations. The author sees the actual theoretical correspondence of these two theories as a confirmation of the correctness of this basic path, along which both are headed. The experimental research already cited demonstrating that reaction may be strengthened and accelerated in the presence of opposing and obstructing stimulations may be analyzed simultaneously with respect to respect both to a manifestation of an impulse for dominance and a manifestation of overcompensation. L. L. Vasilev and I have described these phenomena under the label of dominant processes. V. P. Pratapopov has shown that 
judging by the greater persistency and intensity of concentration developing as reaction, the physically handicapped surpass normal people. He explained this by the characteristics of the dominant process. This means that the potential for overcompensation is greater in the handicapped. It is impossible to analyze questions of education without a future perspective. Detailed examination will lead us to conclusions which attest to this fact. Thus, I.A. Sokoliansky came to the paradoxical conclusion that the education of the deaf-blind is easier than the education of the deaf-mute, the education of the deaf-mute easier than that of the blind, that of the blind easier than that of normal children, while, in fact, this sequence is really established by the degree of complexity and difficulty of the pedagogical process. He saw in this the direct result of the application of reflexology to a re-examination of the views on abnormality. This is not a paradox, asserts so Sokoliansky, but the natural deduction of the new views on the nature of man and the essence of speech. Proto-Popov came to a similar conclusion in his experimental research, namely that for the blind deaf. The opportunity for social communication can be established with extreme ease. How do such psychological presuppositions benefit pedagogy? It is absolutely clear that it is beneficial to compare the education of blind deaf children with that of normal children on the basis of the degree of difficulty and complexity only when we have in mind equal pedagogical goals under various conditions. Normal hearing children. Only a common task and a single level of pedagogical achievements can serve as the overall measure of difficulty of education in both cases. It would be foolish to ask which is more difficult, to teach a gifted eight-year-old child the multiplication table or a handicapped child advanced math. Here, the ease in the first case is conditioned not by specific traits, but by the easiness of the task. It is easier to teach a blind deaf child because the level of his development, the aspiration for his development, and the educational goals to be met are minimal. If we wish to teach the normal child only the minimum, hardly anyone will argue that this would demand more work. On the contrary, if we were to assign the teacher of the deaf the same large-scale tasks facing the educator of a normal child, hardly anyone would undertake the task, let alone seek to do it with less effort. Who can more easily be developed into a specific social unit such as a worker, a shop assistant, or a journalist? A normal child or one who is blind and deaf? One can only answer this question in more than one way. As Pratapapov states, for the deaf mute, the opportunities for social communication are easily established. However, in minimal proportions, a club for the deaf or a boarding school will never become the center of social life. Or let it first be proven that it is easier to teach a blind deaf child to read a newspaper or to enter into social discourse than it is a normal child. Such conclusions inevitably arise if we examine only the mecha mechanics of education without taking into consideration the course of development of the child himself and his perspectives. The operation of overcompensation is determined by two features, by the range and extent of a child's disability the degree of divergence in his behavior and the social demands made for his education. On the one hand, and by the compensatory reserve and the wealth and diversity of functions on the other hand, this reserve is meager in a blind deaf child. His ineptness is huge. Therefore, it is not easier, but immeasurably more difficult to educate blind deaf children than normal children if the same results are desired. As a result of all these constraints, what remains and has a deciding significance for education is the possibility that a child with defects may achieve full, even superior social standing. This is achieved exceedingly seldom. However, the possibility itself for successful overcompensation stands out like a blazing torch, like a lighthouse guiding the path of education. To think that every defect will inevitably have a fortunate outcome is just as naive as it is to think that every illness will certainly be ultimately cured. Above all, we need a temperate view and realistic evaluations. We know that the problems in overcompensating such defects as blindness and deafness are enormous. The compensatory reserve is poor and insufficient in the development 
developmental path exceedingly difficult. Therefore, it is even more important to know the correct direction. In fact, even Sokolianski took this into account, and to it he owes the large success of his system. It is not this theoretical paradox which is so important for his method, but an excellent practical conditional setting for education. According to his method, mimicry, sign language, not only becomes absolutely pointless, but the children themselves do not use it even on their own initiative. On the contrary, oral speech becomes an insurmountable, insurmountable physiological need for them. This is something about which not a single method in the world can boast and which serves as the clue for the education of the deaf mute. If oral speech becomes a necessity and supplants mimicry for the children, then it means that instruction is directed along a line of natural compensation of deafness. Its direction is in line with and not in conflict with the children's interests. Traditional instruction in oral speech, like a worn cogwheel, did not mesh with the whole mechanism of a child's natural strengths and drives. It did not stimulate inner compensatory acti activity and was therefore ineffectual. Beaten into children with classical cruelty, oral speech became the official language of the deaf. The task of education, however, must be summed up as a mastery of a child's inner developmental strengths. If Sokolianski's chain method has achieved this, then it is because the method in fact incorporated and mastered the forces of overcompensation. These initial successes are not a reliable indicator of the merits of the method. This is a question of techniques and their perfection. Finally, it is a question of practical success. Only the physiological need for speech ensures success and is of primary importance here. If the secret for creating this need, i.e. establishing the goal, has been discovered, it is speech itself. The position established by Petzold has the same meaning and value for the education of the blind. The possibility of knowledge for a blind person means the possibility of acquiring full knowledge of everything. A blind person's potential for understanding means basically the possibility of understanding everything completely. As the author sees it, two characterological features categories the entire psychological makeup and structure of personality in a blind person. An unusual spatial limitation and a total, total mastery of speech. A blind person's personality grows out of the struggle between these two factors. To what extent Petzgold's, or Petz, Petzold's principle will be realized in a blind person's life? What measures and what time frame will be needed for its implementation are questions for the practical development of education. After all, even normal children more often than not fail to realize their full potential in the course of their education. Does the proletarian child really achieve that degree of development for which he has the potential? The same can be said of blind children. However, in order to correctly design even a modest educational plan, it is extremely important to discard the constraints limiting our mental outlook. That is, those constraints which supposedly by their very nature frame the special development of such a child. It is important that education aim to realize social potential fully and consider this to be real, uh, to be a real and definite target. Education should not nurture the thought that a blind child is doomed to social inferiority. Summing up, let us dwell on one example. Although in recent times scientific analysis has worked to de-emphasize the legend of Helen Keller. Nevertheless, her fate best illustrates the entire course of our thoughts developed here. One psychologist noted absolutely correctly that if Keller had not been blind and deaf, she would never have achieved the development, influence, and fame which came her way. How is one to understand this? First of all, it means that her serious handicaps evoked enormous compensatory powers. But this is still not all. You see, her reserve of compensations was excessively meager. Secondly, this means that if it had not been for an exceptionally fortunate concurrence of circumstances, which transformed her handicap into social pluses, she would have remained an underdeveloped plain inhabitant of provincial America. But Helen Keller became a sensation. She became the center of social attention. She turned into a celebrity, a national hero into a miracle for many millions of American citizens. She became the pride of the people, a fetish. 
Her handicap became socially useful to her. It did not create an inferiority complex. She was surrounded by luxury and fame. Special steamboats were even made available for her educational excursions. Her education became the concern of the entire country. Immense social demands were made of her. There were those who wanted to see her become a doctor, a writer, a preacher, and she became all of these. Now it is almost impossible to tell what really belonged to her and what was done for her by citizen demand. This fact best illustrates the role played by the social demand for her education. Keller herself wrote that if she had been born into a different setting, she would have sat in eternal darkness and her life would have been a wasteland, cut off from any communication with the outside world. In her biography, everyone recognized living proof of independence, strength, and spiritual life entrapped in the body's prison. Even given ideal external influences on Helen Keller, one author writes, we would not have seen her rare book if her dynamic, powerful, albeit caged-in spirit had not burst forth irrepressibly to meet this influence from the outside. <clears throat> Understanding that the condition of being deaf-blind is not only the sum of two components, and that the essence of the concept of deafness and blindness goes much deeper. The author seeks this essence in a traditional religious, spiritual interpretation. Yet the life of Helen Keller did not contain anything mysterious. Her life graphically demonstrates that the process of overcompensation can be defined entirely by two factors. By the popular social demand for her development and education, and by a reserve of psychological forces. This widespread social demand for Helen Keller's development and for a successful social victory over her handicaps determined her fate. <clears throat> her defect not only did not become a break, but was transformed into a drive which ensured her development. This is why Adler is right when he advises us to examine and act in connection with the integral life plan and its ultimate goal. Even Kant thought, according to A. Nair, that we will understand an organism if we analyze it as a rationally constructed machine. <clears throat> Adler advises us to examine the individual as a personified tendency toward development. There is not a grain of stoicism in the traditional education of children with mental defects. This education has been weakened by a tendency toward pity and philanthropy. It has been poisoned by morbidness and sickliness. Our education is insipid. It nips the pupil in the bud. There is no salt to this education. We need tempered and courageous ideas. Our ideal is not to cover over a sore place with cotton wadding and protect it by various methods from further bruises, but to clear a wide path for overcoming the defect, for overcompensation. For this, we need to assimilate these socially oriented processes. However, in our psychological grounding for education, we are beginning to lose the distinction between um, lose the distinction between the upbringing of animal offspring and the upbringing of children, between training and true education. Voltaire joked that having read um, Voltaire joked that. Having read J.J. Rousseau, he felt like walking on all fours. This is precisely the feeling which almost all our new science about the child evokes. It often examines a child as if he were on all fours. This notably is what P.P. Blonsky recognized. <clears throat> I like very much to put a toothless child in the pose of a four-legged animal. It always tells me a lot personally. Strictly speaking, scientists study the child only in this position. E.B. Zalkine calls this the zoological approach to childhood. There can be no argument. This approach to the study of a human being as one of the animal species, as a higher mammal form, is very important. But this is not all, and not even the main thing for the theory and practice of education. S.L. Frank, continuing Voltaire's symbolic joke, says that, in contrast to Rousseau, nature forgoeth does not negate but straightforwardly demands the vertical position for man. It does not call man back to a simplified prehistoric primitivity, but forward toward the development and a greater complexity of human nature. Of these two poles, the ideas expressed here are closer to those of Goeth than to those of Rousseau. 
If the doctrine on conditional reflexes traces man's horizontal course then, the theory of overcompensation gives him a vertical line.